Hey guys, it's Danny. Today we have yet another detective style type of videos. It's one of those videos in which we try to find a solution to a problem. And this problem is, well, what we talked about about a week ago or two weeks, the stumpy, tiny little leaves on Phalaenopsis orchids. I was telling you then that my Phalaenopsis singolo is starting to produce very crowded, let's say, leaves that are very dense in lack of better wording. And this strangely reminds me of a few cases that I know for about two years already. And ever since I got this case in my collection, I kind of put the pieces together and I think I know what's going on and I think I have a solution. But before all of this, let me just remind you, I'm not a chemist, not a biologist. I don't work in the trade of orchids. I don't know what nurseries really use in their greenhouses. All I'm doing here is guessing and speculating because not only I am an orchid collector, I'm also a customer and I'm paying money for this orchid and I have the right, just like you guys, to know what to expect. Just like with the blue orchid, just like with the single oak orchid and now with this, we as customers need to know what's going on. And until somebody comes clean and tells us what they're doing, we're just going to guess here. But do take it with a grain of salt. If you're a chemist or know more than me, do share it with us down below in the comment section because there is a chance I'm very wrong with what I'm about to say today. As always, all the articles that I will refer to today are linked down below in the description. Please feel free to check them out yourself. So with that said, let's get to the subject. So in case you don't know what the problem is, I will just explain it really fast. What people are experiencing are Phalaenopsis orchids, which seemingly look perfectly normal, start to grow tiny stubby little leaves just like these. They're very rigid, they're very concentrated, in lack of better words. And all of these orchids are pretty much new orchids. This does not happen with old orchids in a collection. It happens only with newly purchased orchids, only with the new leaves they produce in our care. Now, this is not, let's say, the best example. I only have two leaves here, uh, but I'll try to show you some Google searches on the screen. The first time that I heard about this phenomenon was about a couple of years ago. One of my subscribers asked me about it. I researched it. I found a thread on a forum, which you'll have linked down below with the very same issue. They couldn't really figure it out. I couldn't really figure it out. I didn't know what to advise my viewer, but I did have this case in my mind. At the beginning of the year, I saw a video from William Green here on YouTube. I'll link you to that video down below as well, in which he was presenting several Phalaenopsis orchids, standard orchids, not singles or anything, from a botanical garden, which looked in the very same way. The older leaves looked normal, but then the new leaves, they all looked very stumpy, very weird actually. And yet again, I couldn't really explain it. Maybe something in the fertilizer or in the water or in the air. But now that I have this happening in my collection with the singolo, and this is very important, I think I'm kind of figuring it out, or at least I have an idea of what's going on. So in my video about the singolo, which again, I'll link it down below, I was talking about tampered orchids. What this means is orchids which were treated with some growth stunters or some substances that prevented them from growing. What these substances were, I have no idea. I kind of thought they were substances that were affecting hormones. Well, I think we need to start from the very beginning what are plant hormones and what plant hormones do we know about. All right, so on the screen right now, you'll see an article, which of course you'll find in the description below. Pretty much the plant hormones are the molecules who dictate or give commands to the plant. They decide how long the leaves will grow, when the orchid will bloom, when it will stop blooming, when it will grow taller or shorter. They pretty much control plants. And currently we know about five big plant hormones and we really need to know what these are. First, there's the auxin. The auxin dictates how the plant will move. Ever seen plants lean towards the sun? Well, auxin is to blame. Auxin stimulates growth. And in many products, we can actually find auxin as a growth stimulator. Then there's gibberellin, which is actually one of the main characters in today's story. Gibberellin has kind of similar effects as auxin, but it's a different hormone. And one of the things it does is it promotes stem elongation between nodes of a stem. What does this mean? Well, the stem of an orchid is actually the axis. In the case of Phalaenopsis, this is the axis. 
but it can also refer to flower spikes. The spikes are stems as well. Gibberellin is considered the second growth hormone. The third hormone is cytokinin. And you might have heard about this one as well. It is a very common hormone in growth stimulants. Pretty much it takes care of the orchid. It maintains it, if you will, youthful. It has a role in cell regeneration, but also in self-healing. Whenever we break a leaf or a stem or something of the sorts, cytokinin and auxin actually help it heal itself and rejuvenate wherever possible the damaged tissue. Auxin, gibberellin, and cytokinin are considered growth hormones. However, there are two more hormones which are antagonists. They help the orchid stop growing or finish blooming or drop flowers or flower spikes. One of these hormones is called ethylene. And again, we might have already heard about ethylene. It helps with fruit ripening. In the world of orchids, we try to avoid it because it can actually make orchid flowers drop faster. And the last hormone, which happens to be the second main character of our story is abscisic acid. Let's just call it from now on ABA for the ease of conversation. Now. ABA has many, many roles. It actually is responsible for drought reactions in plants. It actually protects the orchids by controlling the opening and closing of the stomatas. But there's something else that it does. It is considered to be an antagonist of gibberellin. Let's remember what that one did. It promoted stem elongation. ABA prevents stem elongation. On the screen, you should see right now excerpts from another article, which you'll find down below, which talks a little more about the ABA hormone. So it has different roles. It actually helps plants and orchids in general, even if it is considered an antagonist to gibberellin. But if you look at point seven in this article, we can see that ABA inhibits stem elongation, probably by its inhibitory effect of gibberellic acid. And to translate that into orchid terms, it means a shorter stem or a shorter axis. Why would we want that? Well, because of flower spikes. If a flower spike is not as elongated, typically it has a more compact look. As I understand, the flower count is not necessarily affected, the length of the stem is. So what we will eventually end up with is a shorter flower spike with a bigger density of flowers. Now, do you think this is advantageous for nurseries? Oh, it's very advantageous because the less space orchids take on transport and in their nurseries, the more orchids they can produce or transport, right? So it is in their actual benefit to create compact, full of flowers, stubby, if you will, flower spikes rather than the long and very airy, let's put it like that, flower spikes that Phalaenopsis are known to produce sometimes. So presuming this effect of ABA on orchids, do you think it's plausible that nurseries use it just to control the flower spike, just to make it more attractive and take less space before the orchid blooms? Well, I think it is very possible. In my last video, one of my viewers pointed out something, and this is a very good idea. Do you notice how the older leaves are kind of normal, not necessarily on the single O, but with the other Phalaenopsis as well, which are affected? The old leaves seem okay. Well, what about the new leaves after the flower spike? They don't seem okay. So something happened in between the creation of the older leaves and the new leaves. And the only thing that happened is a flower spike. So my viewer was proposing a theory in which nurseries apply something to the orchids right when they start to produce the flower spike. And then as a consequence, the new leaves start to be stumpy. And that would make a lot of sense if we're talking about ABA treatment, because we don't need the orchids to be stumpy all the time, right? We just want the flower spikes to be stumpy. But hold on, nurseries need space. They actually like stubby orchids, not only flower spikes, right? Wrong. Stubby leaves mean less photosynthesis, means less flowers. Everything is strictly related. The less energy we have, the less flowering we will have because the orchid will simply not be able to invest that much energy. So the orchid, I suppose, I suspect, is left natural or okay. And then when it starts to produce the flower spike, it is treated with something. And what we're seeing here is the side effect. And again, this is just a theory that really makes sense to me. 
So I think it is actually pretty clear to see that I really am suspecting ABA here. And the fact that I have issues on my single O, well, that's a little suspicious because let's remember how the single O looks like. It is a big orchid with big, big flowers. Did you actually notice how long the flower spike is on this orchid? It's pretty short. If we think about the very big varieties of white phalaenopsis, such as the Sogo Euchidian, you know that the flower spikes are really, really long and that the first buds actually happen after 35 to even 40 centimeters after the flower spike starts forming from the base. In the case of the single O, did you notice how soon the orchid flowered? Yes, the flower spike was cut, but the distance between the actual stem and the first flower is 20 centimeters? That's really not normal. So I suspect that something which controlled stem elongation was applied. And the only one that I can think of after my research is ABA. And even though this is just suspicion, speculation, call it whatever you will, I don't know what nurseries do, I don't know if they really dose ABA, but I really wanted to get to the bottom of this because knowing a potential cause can give you an idea of how to correct it. And if this is indeed ABA treatment, I think there is a way to reverse it. So on the screen you will see another article right now from Maximum Yield. It talks more about ABA. ABA is a hormone that all orchids and all plants produce, but you know my life motto, everything that is good and useful, if it's used excessively, it becomes very bad. Well, that's the case with the ABA. So one of the things that this article mentions is that ABA does not play well with others, meaning it interacts or even nullifies the effect of the other hormones. For example, gibberellins promote elongation while ABA inhibits it. So in our case, if indeed we are discussing about ABA treatment, what happens is we have a lack of gibberellin and maybe not only, even auxin. I do suspect we have a hormonal imbalance that is pushed to extreme in our case. How do we reverse it? Well, in my research, I didn't find something that me or the normal home grower can have access to, maybe chemists can have access to, but what I think can help is dosing gibberellin at least, and maybe auxin. And I'm saying this presuming that we have a lack of gibberellin here. Where can we find gibberellin? Simple. In growth boosters and additives. Now I have Super Thrive, as you might know I tried it, I didn't use it since. And if you look on the ingredients, you don't see gibberellic acid or anything of the sorts, you see 96% other elements. They're pretty much secret, I think. Some people on the internet suggest that it does have some plant hormones, I don't know. There are, however, some uh, additives or boosters which do specify they contain gibberellic acid. So that's where we're gonna find it. So I'm thinking that if we start to dose some growth hormones, maybe we can actually counteract the ABA overdosage. Now, I will try Super Thrive, although I'm not sure what it has. I want to see if it actually has any effect. I might go ahead and buy something that has gibberellic acid. I'm not entirely sure. We'll see what to do. But I will try to not over uh, do it with the Super Thrive and stuff of the sorts. I'm just gonna follow the instructions that we can find for orchids and see what happens. Because the question now is, will this orchid ever return to normal? Well, my suspicion is yes, it might. I mean, at some point it might stabilize again. But considering that I did have comments which were saying, yeah, I had an orchid like this and after one year, it's kind of starting to come back. Um, in the video from William Green, I don't know how long those orchids were in the botanical garden, but they looked like they were there over a year and I didn't see much progress. So are we willing to wait a year, two years until the orchid bounces back or are we gonna try to help it out? Mind you, with these additives and boosters, because they do contain plant hormones, and we should never play with hormones if we don't know what we're doing, they can actually cause some weird looking flowers. There are many cases on the internet of people having some mutated flowers, so we do need to be careful, of course, what we're doing. But 
I just want to try it out at this point you know flowers I can enjoy them in the next years I just want to see if that thing has any effect on my little situation here if it does if it speeds up the recovery process then I guess we found our culprit right but of course this is just my little theory here all I want to do is get to the bottom of this because yes it's just a few cases yes it's the single but in the USA, we have cases with normal, standard Phalaenopsis. If this becomes a practice, you know, I'm not gonna stand here and give everybody morality lessons, but at least customers need to know. When we purchase a plant, if we really want to take care of it, we go and research. We read a book, how do we take care of a rose? And then we take care of it. And if something like this happens, which is not written in the books, we're gonna be like, oh, what's happening here? I purchased this plant because I wanted to grow it. Here I have the little book, I did my research, I wanted to grow this plant and look at here, what do I have here, what is this? We need to know. I do believe customers need to know. Same thing happened with the blue orchid, everybody had to find out the hard way. Now the single orchid, again everybody's convinced it's not the world's first one flowered phalaenopsis, it's just aesthetically the one flowered phalaenopsis, but this, this is on a whole new level. If plants will start to be treated in this way and all phalaenopsis on the market will start to present these type of symptoms, it's not gonna be okay, you know? But at this point, everything is just speculation. And of course, if you know more than me, leave a comment down below and tell us what you know. And yeah, fingers crossed we'll get to the bottom of this. Alrighty guys, thank you for watching this video. Hope you've enjoyed it. Like or dislike this video below. Subscribe to my channel for more orchid videos, tutorials, Q&As, and everything orchid related. Turn on notifications just so you don't miss any video. And don't forget to expand the description. For more information, useful links, and of course the description of the products that I use in my grow space. And with that said, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye!